just remove that. Yeah, that way it's all recorded. Um, so when you're ready to speak, just unmute that, and then you should be good to go. Okay. Yes. <laughs> I'm sure there's a much more efficient way of doing this. Whoa. <laughs> It is part of my presentation. Uh -huh. I figured it went with the theme. I have no idea where it actually is. It just popped up on the PowerPoint. Eventually, I would like moonlighting three quarter of Actually, I Thank you. 
I just wanted to see how many people are. Oh, there's only nine people on. get started this afternoon while everyone has some lunch. I'm Dan Raybeck. I'm one of the uh, elder EMIMs, PGY6. Um, my topic today is going to be environmental injuries. It's a fairly broad topic. We're going to have a lot of things to cover. Um, and we'll get started. Or not. It's just my computer. 
Disclosures, uh, I have no disclosures. Uh, I have made children and since I lecture every once in a while, you are forced to look at them. On the left is my oldest, Ben. He is gonna be five this December. Uh, my youngest, who is in the middle two pictures, he is William, he is gonna be three. And it's nonstop action at home. All right, first topic is gonna to be exposures and temperature regulation. So normal temperature regulation is between 36.9 degrees Celsius plus or minus 0.4. This is maintained primarily by blood skin flow uh, uh, fluctuations to dissolve heat or to induce shivering and vasoconstriction. Um, an interesting point about this is that the skin blood flow can actually increase from a basal rate of about 0.2 liters per minute to up to eight liters per minute uh, if your temperature is near 39 degrees Celsius. For definitions, hypothermia is defined as a core body temperature less than 35 degrees Celsius. And hyperthermia is usually defined as a core temperature greater than 40 degrees Celsius. Obviously, there's a lot of reasons to have hyperthermia and what we see in the ICU usually is um, a slew of other diagnoses, but from this lecture standpoint, we'll focus primarily on heat exhaustion as well as heat stroke. From a hypothermic standpoint, um, this develops when you have a loss of compensatory mechanisms to gain heat. You either lose too much from your skin or you have some skin disruption or vasodilation, or you can't maintain thermoregulatory, um, the HPA axis, you're malnourished, you're autonomically insufficient or very extreme of age, or you have impaired central thermoregulation from other ongoing issues like malignancy, sepsis, uremia, or advanced stage. The normal response to hypothermia is increased respiratory rate, you increase your heart rate contractility, you have vasoconstriction to maintain your core body temperature, and then you increase your muscle tone and shivering. When you first encounter a hypothermic patient, this is more, uh, we don't see this too much in the ICU, but one of the important things is that it's very difficult to get a temperature on these patients. And they've actually developed a clinical staging system. When you look at the patient that you think is uh, hypothermic, you can estimate their temperature based upon their clinical status. If they're conscious and shivering, usually they're above 32 degrees, but if they're not conscious and not shivering, think that they're less than 33 degrees. Um, and then once you get to about 24 to 28 degrees Celsius, sort of where you start to lose your vital signs. So hypothermia management. Most of what we see obviously upstairs is, um, is your patients that are targeted temperature management. And again, they get down to where 32, 34 degrees. Um, from an ER standpoint, we're getting close to winter time. And a lot of times we'll see uh, unfortunate accidental hypothermia, um, either intoxicated patients that get left outside, maybe patients who don't have homes, um, and during the winter months, it can be hard to maintain for a long period of time. <clears throat> Excuse me. The first thing to do is you want to get a core uh, temperature on these patients. And the most accurate is a temp foley or an esophageal probe. There are a lot of physiologic changes to consider in your hypothermic patient. Um, one of which with the medications that you give is that PO meds basically have a very slow onset. And pro drugs actually have a much slower onset when you give them. And the other issue is that active drugs have increased risk of toxicity. And as you warm these patients, your volume of distribution actually increases and your response to these medications can vary wildly. Also important to know in these hypothermic patients is that our blood gas analyzers operate at 37 degrees Celsius. So when a patient is hypothermic, they actually have lower uh, PCO2s, lower PAO2s, and they're more alkalotic. So um, I'm gonna touch just a little bit that there's been two large schools of thought when these hypothermic patients is how you target um, the ventilatory strategies in these patients with a pH versus an alpha ventilation. Basically, it, it comes down to whether or not you wanna correct for their PCO2 or you just wanna go for your pH on the corrected um, blood gas sample because they'll take the blood from your patient, warm it up to 37, and then you get your values. So it's very important to know that um, here they, they comment on the temperature at which they run the blood gas so you'll know which strategy you have. Um, but if you have a patient who is hypothermic, say their targeted temperature, it's important to know that the actual values um, that they have for their pH and PCO2 are going to be lower if, the, if it's been correct, if the temperature has been warmed in the blood sample. Also important to know that coagulation factors don't operate as well if you're outside of 37 degrees. The TAG, uh, PT, APTT also can be very inaccurate. So these patients can be, uh, they can be coagulopathic. So then you come to your options for your rewarming. 
You have passive rewarming. We do a lot of that here. The Arctic Sun can be used to help rewarm patients. It's very effective. You can do 40 degree IV fluids. You can also do active rewarming with esophageal bladder irrigation, uh, peritoneal irrigation, and pleural irrigation. Um, and then you also have your extracorporeal rewarming. These are the patients that uh, you can actually consult surgery and they can do VA ECMO or bypass to actively reward these patients um, if they're in a VFib arrest or asystole. Does anyone know what the uh, lowest recorded temperature was for someone that survived accidental hypothermia? Thirteen degrees. Um, it was a, a Swiss patient, I think it was Swiss or Scandinavian patient, who was basically found in the water and was 13 degrees. She had 45 minutes of cardiac standstill. She was fixed, dilated, and pure white. And then they uh, put her on bypass, warmed up 36 degrees. And then an hour into resuscitation, she had her first heartbeat. Spent 30 days on the vent and then was uh, discharged to another facility where she recovered. Had good neurologic recovery. So, um, you know, more for the patients that you'll see in the ER or some other places where the ER doesn't actually resuscitate them. Um, it's important to know and to really live by the term, they're not dead till they're warm and dead. <laughs> so warm these patients up. So how do you manage the hypothermic cardiac arrest? Because this is the biggest, obviously, leading cause of mortality. Um, there's no changes in CPR recommendations. They have seen good outcomes with prolonged CPR in these patients, so efforts continue until they're essentially 35 degrees. They have documented that you can have up to five minutes of uh, interruption in CPR if your core temperature is between 20 to 28 degrees um, and still have favorable outcomes. And again, rewarming is the most important factor to restore perfusing rhythms. Some of the recommendations would suggest that you can actually withhold all your medications because they basically don't have any effect until you're 30 degrees or more. And then you can double your intervals until they're 35 degrees. Some would say that you can try three initial shocks for a VTVF arrest, but basically after that, its utility is very low until you warm them to greater than 30 degrees. One interesting concept um, that I have actually seen um, which was kind of weird, was a uh, core temperature after drop. So if you're perfectly warming these patients, you have to realize their core body temperature is actually warmer than their skin. So if you're giving them the Arctic sun or um, giving them a bunch of warm saline, that will flow through the periphery and then that cold uh, blood will actually circulate inwards and their temperature will drop initially before they start to warm up. So it's an important concept to consider. And again, when you rapidly rewarm these patients, there's a lot of cerebral vasodilation. You lose your auto-regulation of blood flow. Um, so important to consider when you have your neurologic examination on the patients. Important to keep in mind the hyperkalemia that results from the shifts in the lab bill, taking sugar in a very, very cold. And consider that, you know, your insulin, basically, these patients are going to have a very delayed effect, so watch your kids. Hyperthermia, poor body temperature above 40 degrees Celsius. Um, heat stroke uh, is a sort of defined between a classic and an exertional component. The classic is, um, you know, we see here in Detroit sometimes, elderly patients, chronic comorbidities, they, their air conditioning doesn't work and they can't regulate their body temperature so they get above 40 degrees. Or exertional, the healthy individuals who undertake strenuous activities and environments with high temperature and high humidity. <laughs> the important clinical feature between heat exhaustion and heat stroke is the neurologic dysfunction that occurs with heat stroke. These patients are delirious, they have seizures, they're in a coma. And then obviously, if you have distributive shock and multi-system organ dysfunction, uh, it's more consistent with the heat stroke than heat exhaustion. So that comes to how do you manage your hyperthermia? So the treatment is largely supportive. You focus on uh, cooling the patient. Um, this wasn't as large as I was hoping it to be. Oh, no, that's not too bad. So there's obviously passive. You can do Arctic Sun here. They get... Um, um, you can use it to cool them. You can use some passive stuff with some fans and cool blankets. Then you can actively rewarm them intravascular uh, or cool them down intravascular. You can use cold saline. Extracorporeal is always an option as well if you can't keep them down. But usually, um, because of the large volume of blood flow, peripheral is just fine. And this is all exposure. Obviously, if you have a neuroleptic malignant or a very septic patient, um, you can try and keep them cool. And you can use these same strategies, but for the purpose of this lecture, it's largely uh, environmental exposures. Mm -hmm. 
I, Daenerys of House Targaryen, first of my name, breaker of shades and mother of dragons, sentence you to die. Obviously very dramatic, so our next topic is going to be burns. So uh, important to recognize here, um, we are not a burn center, and we do not see a lot of these thermal burns, but what are some things that we do see that we can characterize as burns and can send elsewhere if need be? Let me use my words better. Are there other problems with the skin that we can see from maybe drugs and other things that, yeah, 10 and SJS and stuff like that. So those are treated similarly. They have the same loss of the epidermal layers and they have large protein loss. They have large fluid loss um, and they can't control the temperature. So they, they're treated exactly as burns and you characterize them the same as a thermal burn. Um, so that's what we see here more of, uh, even though they are somewhat infrequently. So the important thing to know about thermal burns is you can, um, there's a lot of characteristic pictures, imaging, and how the burn looks as long with some clinical features to try and determine your first, second, or third, or fourth degree burns. So the first thing obviously is, is the skin red or is it pale? It's gonna help determine. Typically your more superficial things. Um, and yes, this is a picture of me on the right, and no, I'm just kidding. But that is what I look like during the summer. Um, so first degree burns basically damage to the basal layer of the epidermis. These are typically dry, they're red, they're very painful to the touch. Um, they're a very classic sunburn. And these are similar to a flash type burn, a quick exposure to a high flame. You have epidermal burns. Um, usually these don't scar over, and they can flake later on. Usually just topical or systemic into, um, uh, analgesics are enough to cover these. Then you start getting into your superficial and your deep burns. Your secondary burns, um, these are damage to the dermis. There's no injury to the hair follicles, the oil glands. Healing typically is by epithelialization, but obviously it's much slower than your superficial burns. <clears throat> the important part for secondary degree burns is if there's blistering, it's a second degree burn. So that's a, it's a huge component to it. Um, and they'll be a little bit more painful typically than your average sunburn. They're a little bit more moist appearing um, and they're, they're quite red. Deep burns. So these are your deep dermis. They get into the fat layer. And then obviously with the quote unquote fourth degree burn, it's burning into the muscle and the bone. <clears throat> this is destruction of the entire epidermis, the dermal layer, and then the fat layer. Classically, these will be pale, uh, they'll be leathery appearing. They will not be tender. You have essentially singed your, singed your entire nervous plexus, and so they are not that tender to touch. These heal by contraction, scar deposition. And these require grafts to avoid scar, scar formation, but it does, if it does get deep enough into the muscle and the bone, typically grafts won't work. The important part about working at a non-burn center is when do I refer to a burn center? So the biggest thing to know is obviously DMC is our local burn center around here. So they're the ones that we would send. So when do I send them? <clears throat> According to the American Burn Center, any partial thickness, second degree or greater burn with 10% of the total body surface area is important to send. Burns involving the face, hands, feet, genitalia, major joints, perineum, any third degree burn, any electrical, chemical, or inhalation burn injury, burn injury in patients with chronic comorbidities that will affect the recovery or the mortality, or if there's concomitant trauma. The caveat being, um, if the trauma is more life-threatening than the bleed, then you stabilize them first and then send them. Or children or any patients who require special interventions. And this was very nicely summarized in the American Burn Association, their life support. Um, but it's important to keep these in mind when we have the SJS or the 10, the ones that we see, um, if they fall into this category, then they really should be managed at a burn center. Management. The ABCs take precedent over any burn. Airway. Extensive burns, they lead to massive edema. And obviously in the airway, massive edema is not a good sign. So any burn with 30 to 45, 35 to 40% of the total body surface area really should consider intubation as well as any burn to the head and mouth, as these patients are going to need to be transferred to a burn center if you're not already there. 
Always secure the airway in these patients if you're at all concerned for a um, airway injury or if there's burns to the head. Um, it's better to intubate them and have a safe transport than to not. Uh, I have a very high index in suspicion that there was a burn to the airway or the head if there's a change in voice, if they're hoarse, any accessory muscle use if a patient continues to cough or appears extraordinarily anxious. <laughs> Obviously, breathing. Maintain your normal SpO2 in your patients with supplemental oxygen. Consider the source of the exposure, and if it's a house fire, strongly consider a concomitant uh, poisoning with either carbon monoxide or cyanide. And then bronchoscopy, obviously, we find soot under the glottis, airway edema, and erythema. <coughs> Establish IVs in these patients, preferably not in a burned area, but if it is not a complete contraindication, um, it'd be ideal to have it not in that area. And then you can place central access depending on your hemodynamic compromise or inability to obtain peripherals. Keep in mind that these patients have massive capillary leak, huge intravascular volume shifts, and a loss of being able to regulate temperature um, and evaporative loss. So how much fluid do you give? Classically, um, pretty much everyone has heard of the Parkland formula at some time or another. Basically, four of the coefficient times, your weight in kilograms times your total body surface area um, that is burned. And that is your total amount of uh, fluid that they recommend to give within a 24-hour period. <clears throat> and as you can guess, it's quite a significant amount. So if you have an 80-kilogram man who burned 45% of his total body surface area, that's 14 liters in the 24-hour period. Recommendations are that half of that volume is given in the first eight hours, the rest over the next 16. They have looked at this multiple times, and largely what the recommendations are now is that you can start with this formula as sort of a guideline but really your endpoint should be to maintain urine output of about a cc per kg per hour. And then after your 24 hours in these burn patients, switch up your fluids, keep them uh, glucose. You can give them some uh, potassium in that as well. And then you have to take into account their evaporative fluid loss times their total body surface area and calculate that into your basal rate of fluids. But again, the major thing here is your, is your endpoints, which is pretty much urine output. And again, another diagram that most people have probably seen at one point or another, the rule of nines. Um, I didn't include the children one. Um, they're a little bit different, but for most adults, uh, the head, uh, each arm is 9%, each leg is 18, and then the trunk is uh, 36 total, but 18 in the front, 18 in the back. And this is just a quick rule of thumb to try and calculate the body surface area at the front. <laughs> There's also the box score, which was established in 1991 as a predictor of burn severity and mortality. It's basically how much of the patient's body surface area is burned and the patient's age, and at a time, the score greater than 140 was considered unsurvivable. The patient had an inhalation injury. It had 17 points to that patient's score. Nowadays, even patients with optimal care, if they uh, have 80% of the total body surface area that's been burned, they actually have a decent chance of survival. So wound care. <clears throat> Again, ABCs and then worry about the burns. Cover the wounds with a clean, dry dressing, simple, sterile dressings, elevate the wound, maintain their temperature, wash them with soap and water. The topical antibiotics like bacitracin, neosporin, they're fine for the superficial burns, but for the deep ones, really the sulfur sulfa, sulfur sulfadiazine uh, is much better. It doesn't eliminate the bacteria, but it does help prevent infection. And then obviously, if you have these patients um, at a burn center, um, they'll likely need skin grafting depending on the severity of the burn. Medication should be given primarily IV. Prophylactic antibiotics work as we discussed, but they're they actually not indicated. And then, of course, some life-saving tests. Other things to consider, uh, especially from an ICU standpoint in these patients with pain or with burns, is that early nutrition is very important. They lose a lot of their metallic cofactors for healing, selenium, zinc, and copper. Um, the early nutrition helps reduce catabolism, and then the high-protein formulas are, are much preferred pain control, opioids with the PCA. Kids, a lot of studies with ketamine, they do quite well. You can use it as an adjunct. I think we have a protocol now here uh, for ketamine use in the ICU. Some complications, <clears throat> these patients get a lot of fluid. Um, and so obviously infection is an issue as they lost their epidermal quarter, but also compartment syndrome. Important to keep in mind these patients are getting liters and liters and liters of fluid especially if they have a circumferential burn, they have a lot of losses, they can third space. So the limbs, obviously, if they're losing a pulse, it's much too late. You wanna check their compartments 
Um, if they feel at all elevated, get a striker needle. Um, and basically anything over 30 is considered compromised to nerve and muscle. Big ones to also consider any burns to the chest. Obviously, it creates sort of a restrictive pattern. Um, the patients have a hard time uh, ventilating escherotomies through certain areas. And then uh, burns to the abdomen obviously can lead to an abdominal compartment type syndrome. And then the sequelae that develop from that difficulty to ventilate, you have renal dysfunction, hemodynamic instability. And of course, the RDS. So, okay, one calls. They're like, Junior said, I just got like five recesses. This guy came in, he's kind of coughing. He's like in a house fire, but he looks fine. He was okay. He's on like a non but he looks fine. Like, I just, I don't know what to do. Can you come help me out? And of course you say no, but then you say, yes, I'll come help you and take a look at the patient. So um, which of these patients makes you nervous? Does that make you nervous? Does that make you nervous? That. Yeah. So what do you do after that? So you go on and see the patient, you're like, well, crap, there's a thermal injury to, or a burn injury to the airway. What's your next step? <clears throat> Intubate them. Okay, so what's your next step after that? So you want to take a look, right? Well, that's bad. So say you just do like an awake burn, you're like, I'm just going to take a look. I don't want to intubate them just yet. They look okay. You take a look and you see this. What's your next step? Intubate them. Excellent. Intubate is always the answer. Just kidding. But seriously. Um, secure that airway because these patients, um, even a little bit of irritation can cause significant edema. Uh, and these patients need to secure airway and transfer to a burden center uh, as soon as possible. So you bronch them and then you see this. Um, very, very bad. Thermal injury, um, as you can see, that little ulcer down there and then a lot of stuff. So the clinical characteristics, you guys already recognize them. Blistering to the face, singe, nose, hair, soot uh, throughout the mouth. And then persistent coughing is something to really consider if you see a burn patient. Even if they don't have external signs, uh, it's very concerning. A little bit of information about Detroit. We were actually one of the largest, um, uh, we have one of the highest amounts of structural fires per day. And we had uh, seven per day in 2018 alone. We had an average of about 4,700 residents type of year. And I think that that number was actually down from four years previous. So the inhalation injuries primarily are the smoke uh, that cause the upper airway. And again, because we're such, the lungs are such good at um, thermal regulation, we actually don't get a lot of lower airway burns. It's mostly upper airway. But obviously when you burn the upper airway, you have a lot of edema, inflammation. This causes a lot of sloughing, a lot of edema, gives cellular debris, a lot of mucus, at least cast, obstruction, electrosis, and VT mismatches. So how do you treat these patients? Um, obviously, initially, you want a chest X-ray and ABG for wrist stratification. If you see that patient, intubate them um, and take care of that right away. So secure that airway. They've done a lot of studies looking at IV antibiotics for these patients with a lot of burn injuries. And as it stands now, there was no improvement in ventilator-free days or reduced risk of ventilator-associated pneumonia. <clears throat> Aggressive pulmonary toilet, airway exam, and clearance. Um, the smoke particles, they settle in the bronchioles with mucus and fibrin products. There's a lot of sloughing and obstruction. And so aggressive pulmonary toilet, um, bronchoscopy if needed, and trying to improve uh, the airway. There have been other modalities that they've looked at to try and help. A lot of burn centers have adopted sort of a um, nebulized neck and albuterol, and then some have looked at heparin. I'll touch base very quickly and briefly on the use of heparin. Um, is that's probably what's been the most recently studied to try and help reduce ventilator days and try and reduce infections. But up here in the upper right, there's sort of a mild grading system for inhalation air, uh, airway injuries. And it, it basically comes down to the amount of um, luminal obstruction, the amount of sloughing that you see, necrosis, and then how friable the tissue looks uh, on a grade of zero to four being, being the worst. So very briefly, just looking at some of these studies, Miller in 2009, they took a look at uh, 30 ventilated patients with an inhaled lung injury, and they received nebulized heparin, NAC, and albuterol. These were controlled against historical patients with matched Apache scores and lung injury scores. The experimental group had a tend towards uh, survival benefit, but again, um, this was sort of a retrospective study looking at controlled patients. Um, the most pronounced survival benefit was obviously with those with patch scores greater than 35. 
McIntyre in the, I like to call it the high, high study. Um, this was outcomes following the use of nebulized heparin for an inhalation injury in 2017. This is a case control study in Indiana where they admitted uh, patients and within 48 hours, uh, they had lung injury documented on bronchoscopy and they were matched on a case-to-case -case basis with total body surface area, burns, and age. They nebulized heparin, NAC, and uh, albuterol, or sodium bicarbonate. There were 36 patients in each. Um, and then there were fewer ventilator days and then more ventilator free days in four weeks. But the patients that received the, the heparin, basically there was no difference in hospital length, injury score, mortality, uh, pneumonia rates, or bleeding events. And then again in 2017, did a retrospective study of 48 patients with inhalation injury. They were intubated. They received a similar sort of protocol. Non-heparin patients in this study actually had uh, higher surface area burns and a longer time on the ventilator. There's no difference in hospital length of stay. Um, basically, all of these are vastly underpowered. We don't see a lot of these injuries, but the limitations are all, are all single center. They're non-blinded studies. Um, and especially in this one, not all patients underwent bronch to identify inhalation grade, which I think skew your results. So essentially, the heparin is still sort of up in the air in these burn centers. A lot of places have adopted it because it's really not absorbed terribly. There's not a lot of bleeding risk associated with it, but there may be some trend toward improvement. Gas poisonings. So when you have your inhalation injuries, consider the source of the fire, especially a lot of household fires. Um, obviously, if they're in the house for a long period of time, carbon monoxide, it binds to hemoglobin with much more affinity. Um, you have inadequate oxygenation. These patients, the classic appearance, they're cherry red, they have headaches. Um, but if they have severe poisoning, they can be altered, seizing, they can be comatose. And obviously, the treatment is to give them 100% oxygen. You reduce the half-life of carbon monoxide significantly if you're on 100% oxygen, it's just 75 minutes. I'll we'll talk a little bit in a few slides about the indications for hyperbaric. Um, but the largest issue with carbon monoxide poisoning is the neurologic sequelae that is evident for several weeks afterwards. Another scary one to consider in a lot of these inhalation injuries is cyanide poisoning. When they have burning plastic, linoleum, uh, insulation, you generate uh, cyanide. And so this binds to your metalloproteins, disrupting your oxidative phosphorylation, you have mitochondrial dysfunction, and it's rapidly fatal. These patients have neurologic and cardiovascular collapse rapidly. So if these patients typically um, will be very hypoxic. They'll have significantly elevated lactates, and they've shown that lactates greater than 10 in these inhalation injuries is strongly suggestive of cyanide toxicity. And so if that's the case, reach for your cyanide antidote kit if you have it, or hydroxycobalamin. Um, it should be given within two hours empirically. Um, don't wait for your testing, just get it. So very quickly about hyperbarics. Um, the largest indication for the uh, hyperbaric therapy in carbon monoxide poisoning is benefit of neurologic sequelae down the road. Um, really, the most benefit that was shown was that these patients were dull within six hours of the poisoning. The indications that you can see on the left, if there is greater than 25% um, carboxyhemoglobin, greater than 15 in pregnancy or fetal distress, and essentially if they have any neurologic or cardiac dysfunction, uh, it's important to try and get them dosed. So where do we send them? We have them. So we have one here. We have one here. Um, uh, I don't remember the last time we had an urgent or emergent case that went. Um, we've tried to get it done, but I know it's difficult to get done. The closest center would be DMC, even they have a difficult time with staffing. Toledo is an option. Uh, Grand Rapids has a site. Uh, I know Sparrow has a site, and I can't remember if U of M has a site as well. So who do you call if you have this patient? Who do you call to try and get hyperbarics? So evangelista here. What if you're not here? <laughs> Atmo fixes everything. So call your tox center. Your local or regional or national tox center will help facilitate. They have a list of things. Um, it's important to know what your centers are, especially if you're seeing these patients quite a bit. So you can call TOX um, and they will be able to help you. Yeah, TOX poison control, sorry. Poison control, toxicology um, um, is who you should call. Okay. Why 
Excellent hacking, Tim. So next we're gonna talk about electrical injuries. So majority of electrocutions that we see occur at work. Uh, most of them, um, uh, the rest of them typically occur at home. So power lines, railroads, um, we used to have a lot of oral burns in kids, but before we had the ground fault receptors, um, we don't see it as much. So the patterns of injury, I'm gonna talk very briefly. There's low and high voltage. Uh, low voltage stuff typically is at the house. Um, higher voltage with loss of consciousness is more occupational and you have extensive thermal burns with that. DC current, uh, typically you see with a lot of trauma because they're thrown quite a bit. Um, tasers can deliver pulses about 50,000 volts and then obviously lightning strikes. So some of the pathophys for an electrical injury. The amount of damage really depends on the uh, amount of current that's passing through, the duration of the current, and the tissues that are traversed. So the extent of the injury is not actually the voltage of the watts, it's the amount of amps that are given through the body. So um, heat tissue injury, typically you have uh, about one amp can cause significant burns at the entrance and the exit site. Depolarization of muscle cells. Does anyone know how many amperages it takes to cause VFIP in a human? So maybe about 30 to 100 milliamps can actually cause VFIP. Greater than five amps can actually cause sustained asystole. And then if you have even greater than 20 milliamps, you can have uh, tetany, the phenomenon where you can't let go. So you can also have neurologic injuries. You can have unconsciousness paralysis. You can have autonomic dysfunction, paraplegia, depending on the transverse if it goes across the spinal cord. Ocular injuries, you can develop cataracts later on in life. Renal failure, a lot of times uh, can be from direct, but it's usually from the uh, sustained tetany. You can have rhabdo and hyperemia. And then skin burns is possible as well. Um, you can see an entrance and an exit. Knowing that it's two, like 20, 30 milliamps can cause VFib, how many amps does it take to run a dishwasher? Or a stove? So it's like 10 to 15 amps, like true amps, not milliamps. So it's well within the range to kill any human. So it's very important to know when you're um, playing uh, household um, handyman uh, to really be careful of your electrical circuits and to be very cautious because um, uh, a sustained current like this will very easily kill you. High tension lightning strikes. These are typically with voltages exceeding a thousand. Uh, these are railway tracks, power lines, setup transformers, and the tissue damage is typically done by the generation of the heat um, and the electrical arcing. Lightning injury can also result from a direct injury, the side flash, or the ground current. A lot of times these patients are thrown several feet due to the muscular contractions and they have the resulting trauma as well. The very interesting thing about lightning strikes is that many of the victims survive, even with good neurologic recovery. A lot of times they'll be found asystole, they'll be found dilated pupils, no neurologic response, um, and then you'll get them back and they, they do quite well. Um, usually death is more asystole than actual VFib in these patients. That's from Chernobyl. Very excellent series. All right, so for radiation injury, not something that we see very often. Um, but there's uh, four large types of ionizing radiation. There's alpha particles, beta particles, and then the really bad ones, the gamma radiation, which is the high energy electromagnetic radiation that ionizes and causes and highly penetrates tissue and the neutrons um, that cause significant damage to biologic tissue. The mechanism of injury for all of these radiation, obviously at lower doses with absorption, there's direct interaction with DNA, causes mutation and cancer at low levels over the long term. Um, but at high levels, this radiation causes cellular death. The most sensitive tissue include the bone marrow and the GI mucosa. So acute radiation sickness. The important thing with radiation sickness is it's kind of difficult to assess the dose and the exposure of the patient. Um, they don't really come up to you saying, hey, I just had a nuclear bomb and I was exposed to all the strontium and plutonium inside. So you focus on their clinical symptoms. The earlier the onset of symptoms to the exposure, the worse the prognosis. And so you have four phases that go through acute radiation sickness. Prodromal phase occurs within a few, few 
hours of your exposure. Typically very rapid onset, nausea, vomiting, they, they feel like they're hit by a truck, malaise, headache. Um, and then this resolves quickly, leading you into the latent phase um, where they're symptom free. Uh, and it depends on the amount that they absorbed um, and, the, um, uh, and the system that's affected, but typically the hematopoietic stem cells, the latency periods between two to six weeks, GI symptoms that usually last a few days to a week, and then the, neuro, the neurovascular syndrome is a few hours. <clears throat> then the manifest illness phase, and then the recovery or death phase. The manifest illnesses, so these subsets are basically based on the organ system. They can occur simultaneously, and uh, once you see them, they may actually be irreversible. The cerebrovascular side, uh, these patients can have hyperthermia, they're ataxic, loss of motor control, seizures. These are exposures of 15 to 20 gray or greater. And these are usually due to the free radical induced neuronal death and cerebral edema that results. Pulmonary, um, exposure of six to 10 gray can cause pneumonitis within one to three months. The GI symptoms of gray, six gray or more, anorexia, nausea, vomiting, and then uh, loss of peristalsis, dehydration, and then a lot of times these patients die from enteric sepsis, they have translocation. Hematopoietic, um, very low exposures, one gray or more. Um, the, the hematopoietic stem cells are actually the most sensitive. The lymphocytes are the first to go. They lyse very quickly. Um, so absolute lymphopenia is actually something that you're concerned about when you see a patient with radiation sickness. And then typically uh, it produces a pancytopenia and then again, overwhelming infection causes death. <clears throat> and then cutaneous, obviously local radiation injury that occurs um, ranging from mild burns to bullae to blisters, hair loss, ulceration. Um, desquamation typically occurs at 15 gray and then at uh, necrosis at 50. How do you manage them? So there's two phases to their treatment. The number one is the identification and safety of yourself and the patient. Number one is contact your local authorities, HAZMAT, you can call the US Energy Department, make sure you have your gowns, your gloves, make sure you have face shields, try and get a dosimeter if you can, um, make sure that the patient is properly disrobed, the clothes are disposed of, don't rip or tear their clothes, and then examine them. Um, ABCs obviously then consider that vomiting and the neurologic sequelae that happen if they're early on are very, very poor prognosticators and I'll sort of get to why that is. And then you can use sort of a response category tool uh, to determine the severity and where you should send them for their next level of care. The treatment is supportive. Fluids, Zofran for nausea is uh, shown to be the most effective. Um, if they're neutropenic already, consider those precautions and prophylactic antibiotics for fungal and HSV patients. Um, obviously, there's been limited studies overall showing benefit, but it does appear that uh, granulite stimulating factors can help um, because in animal models, there was uh, increased, um, increased return of, of the hematopoietic function. Um, there was a small survival advantage if started within 24 hours. Um, and then uh, obviously, if you have to give them blood, give them leukocyte reduced irradiated blood. Stem cell transplant has been looked at in these patients. Um, it's very limited because uh, a lot of the studies have shown that with uh, some of the stimulating factors and supportive care, you can actually survive up to seven to eight uh, gray. Um, but basically, if you've absorbed 10 gray of radiation, it's lethal um, and supportive care. So there's very limited uh, amount of support for stem cell transplant in these patients. This did not come in the way that I wanted to. Um, but this is a basically grading system depending on the severity of the patient's presentation. So these are some relative doses that you'll experience. Um, there's a lot of terminology surrounding radiation that I'm not going to bore you with. Just know that the amount of radiation that's absorbed is determining gray or rads, and that depending on um, Bronkins is the actual radiation itself, and then the um, and then some of the dose equivalents in sieverts uh, basically is how you quantify that um, to the patient. And so you can see a whole body CT is probably the highest. Radon is another huge source. Uh, X-rays are right down there, close to living next to a power plant. These are just common agents that you're going to look at the screen and then never see again. These are ones that affect certain body areas, but there is some treatment uh, in trying to decontaminate these patients. Um, with chelation. Radiation injury, the prognosis, it's really determined by the amount of exposure and how quickly you can access medical care. 
as I talked about, uh, a radiation absorbed about 10 gray is considered lethal. Um, and really, they just recommend palliative measures as there's no, nothing that we can really do to support them. Um, but as you can see by the chart, a lot of it, once you get above you know, 3.6, uh, as, as the Chernobyl thing told us, death within about three to five to six weeks in about half of your patient population. So it's pretty significant. Questions? Comments? They, you know, a lot of the studies haven't really commented on one. What I would say is try to use more of your balanced solutions because of the sheer volume you're going to get. Obviously, if you're giving them um, a normal saline of 14 liters, you're going to cause a pretty significant acidosis, you risk some renal dysfunction. Um, so I, I would say LR. Um, I didn't see any comments about albumin or anything of that nature. Um, I'm not sure if there's anyone else in the virtual world that knows, but I think a balanced solution would be your preference. Let's see if there's comments. Can this be changed to full screen? It's not going to Oh, is that how they saw this? Mm -hmm. It was, it was yeah, showing, yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, hopefully, <laughs> 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 mm -hmm. I don't know. 